Martin's going to have a ton to talk about, and Kate has a whole thing to tell you about as well. Um, so uh, I will start. I, I will start turning people people's videos off for you. Uh, so Kate, why don't you introduce yourself, and then I'll, I'll have Martin introduce himself. Uh, you're uh, you're muted. Now you're okay, now you're you. muted. Thank you. I know so many of you here. And it's so good to see you, you know, during the shutdown that we still have a community. So thank you so much, Bob. I'm oh, a literary yeah. manager for True um, for a long time, about what, seven years, Bob? About seven years. And uh, so also I've just founded Create Theater, which is turning into a type of virtual theater company, um, a drama turn. So I work with people on scripts and then usually I like them. Um, like Dave Kurkowski, um, and then, and many of you, <laughs> I don't want to single anybody out. And then I go on and produce them or direct them. So this is just a, a COVID integration of everything. As, uh, as you just said, Bob, before, this is turning into be quite an education and we're all learning a lot. So yeah, let's create theater. Many new skills, many new skills. None of us ever knew we needed. Martin Platt, enter and sign in, please. They were also skills we didn't really want. Yeah. But we're stuck with them. Uh, I'm Martin Platt. I'm a uh, producer. I've done uh, shows on Broadway, off Broadway, off off Broadway in London's West End, uh, on tour in Europe. Uh, I'm a director. I've directed all over the US, off Broadway, Europe, uh, and also a general manager here in New York. Uh, often on Broadway, uh, and maybe in the next year or two, I'll be a film director, still working on this project, so. You're gonna tell us a little bit about that, because that's, that's one of the areas I really wanna to, want to talk about. Um, so, Kate, you're, you've been learning about what, what contracts are needed. Uh, can, can you just t tell us about the learning curve that you've gone through in terms of how how people are producing um, their shows on, on virtual th through you? So it, it started out with just wanting to hold readings to keep us all sane and the work going forward. And then somebody said, oh, are you doing this on an equity contract? So I looked into it and then somebody said, you shouldn't be on an equity contract, go to SAG. So I went to SAG and they, play so much better in this space. So they really are um, the best way to go forward and to record and so that your actors get paid and everything else. So now I'm a fledgling uh, SAG signatory and jumping through all of their hoops so that we can legally and officially um, record Zoom presentations and also just video presentations of musicals and plays. And uh, either, so the actors get paid and everything is all, all cool. Can either you or Martin talk about when when you need a SAG signatory and, and when, when you may not? Mar Martin, do you? you well, I mean, I, I, mean, I mean, basically, I, I think Kate and I talked about this a bit earlier. I mean, the, the issue is, <coughs> going back a step, uh, the Off-Broadway League got involved in this because a lot of people wanted to do these readings of new works and things and stream them. Uh, and Equity pretended their jurisdiction. And there was a dialogue between the Off-Broadway League and Equity and SAG-AFTRA. And SAG-AFTRA finally came with a definite statement that if a work is created for remote viewing only, like it's going to be on, uh, uh, on a streaming platform, then they have sole jurisdiction uh, because it's not being made for a live theater. And this is a distinction. If, if a show has already been in a theater and now you want to stream it, that's a whole different conversation. This is for new work created, especially for streaming. sag after has jurisdiction and they're very, very nice. What, uh, but unlike if you do an equity reading and you just hand everybody $50 or something or $100 and walk away, for sag -Aftra, it's salary, which means you have to have a payroll system set up, workers comp, they, they won't accept fees because they, they consider the actors working. So I think that's what Kate is doing is setting up 
the whole payroll infrastructure. But anybody with payroll infrastructure can sign the, it, it, it's the new media contract with SAG-AFTRA in I think in all of our cases, the one for budgets under $50,000. Mm -hmm. And you contact SAG-AFTRA in Los Angeles, uh, Timothy uh, Kuehl, I think. Yeah, Timothy yes. Kuehl yeah. at SAG-AFTRA in LA. And they send you an electronic copy of the contract and talk you through it. And it's really simple. So Kate, can you explain, explain how your understanding of the, of the signatory and, and how you will how you will function as a, as, an, as a SAG signatory? Well, as Martin just said, um, to do a contract for, for SAG, for SAG-AFTRA, um, you just can't write a check and hand it over to an actor. You have to go through um, a uh, payroll house. So unless you are gonna set yourself up and pay workman's comp and everything else, um, you should have an entity to do that, a producing entity. And um, so that's really what we need on this simple level. I'm not going to start um, producing movies or anything. At least that's not my intention right now. <laughs> so on this basic level and the land of development where I dwell, that's what I need. So that's what I had to do. Okay, so, so um, Martin, let's go back and talk a little bit about the, the, pot, the options that people have if they want to do a virtual presentation. And let's talk about whether they vary if it's all live stream or whether it's partially recorded um, and whether it changes if something remains online for more than, more than the two hours of the presentation. It doesn't really change anything because you know, from equity's point of view, you can't live stream anything without paying pardon my French, a shitload of money. Uh, and, they, and they won't move off that position. So for SAG-AFTRA, you know, their position is, I mean, the deal is basically every performer gets $125 a day for every day on camera. So if you can rehearse for four days and shoot for one day, you could offer people 125 It's a little mingy, but you could do that. And then it's payroll, so there's 14% various payroll taxes and workers' comp, and 19% in uh, SAG after pension and health. And that's, that's it. And by doing that, if, if, if you're doing your presentation uh, to get people to join you in producing it or just sharing it uh, without anybody paying to see it, that's the end of the story and you're allowed to leave it online for six months. So let me just go back to that, because you, you, you quickly offered us the possibility of a way of doing it for $125 plus. So the plus comes to maybe 50 or 60 more dollars, or are we talking $185 or dollars Well, I mean, I, I mean, I'm getting ready to do one, yeah. right, with 12 actors. And the, the period of rehearsal and recording is going to span five days. And SAG after those are eight hour days. They're not, it's not a 29 hour reading. But with the people who are providing money, we've decided to pay them 125 a day because they're working five days. But technically the only days that count on the, the contract cover sheet you sign with SAG after are the days that you're recording or not live the streaming. Not the rehearsal. Okay, it's, I, I'm not sure I follow that. So can you explain what what is required for the rehearsal period? Well, technically the contract says nothing because because when you look at the contract, it asks you how many shooting days. And that multiplies by 125 as the minimum. So, so come to your own conclusions, in other words. Right. I mean, you say to the actors, we're going to give you 250 and you can rehearse a few days and we're gonna shoot one day and then they get the SAG after contract and sign it and on they go. I think I know the answer to this, but somebody's asking what if the actors aren't members of SAG? If, if, if you're members of equity, it's the four A's, SAG accepts you for these contracts without having to join separately. Okay, so, so the actors aren't required to uh, pay a, a, an annual fee to become a SAG member uh, to do this. Not, right. n n not on this on this new media thing. 
uh, there are different rules, which frankly, I don't know if you want to do something on a pay platform. But this is the other thing that a lot of people have done, and you know this, Bob, is that if you're a not-for-profit organization and you want to record something or stream something uh, to, <coughs> to, to legitimately raise money for your not-for-profit theater company, then you go a different way and you go to the theater authority at Equity, which is the, the, the wing that deals with benefits, that allows you to do things paying people nothing. And they, they ask you to pay a stipend. Yes, a small amount. Yeah. But then the, and you pay a small amount to the theater authority. But then the theater Actually not, no. Not I, more. I, no, I asked not during COVID. So, but, but the theater authority then authorizes you to do a benefit. And that's the least expensive way to do it. If you're doing a benefit and people can contribute $10, $20 or whatever to help your theater, which a lot of people are doing, uh, and you're a 501c3, I think that's the cheapest way. Yes, uh, and you can, be, and you actually actually can continue posting it online for for up to four days uh, after your right. presentation. How how long can things stream online through the SAG uh, six contract? Months. Six months. So, um, and they have separate rules which aren't too horrible, mind you. If you create something that you want to put behind a paywall where, you know, it's a pay-per-view. I, I, don't, I don't have the details of that, sadly, but uh, oh, okay. that's not onerous either. It's slightly more expensive, uh, but they do allow that also. So the two options are do it as a, un, under the theater authority, um, do it for, very, for, for very little money. I mean, we did, we did our play reading series through the theater authority, and I think it cost us about fifteen hundred dollars for each of the plays, um, to, in total expenses. Um, Kate, maybe you can address this. Uh, what are the levels of cost for people in terms of presenting the work? Uh, what, what are what are the things that they need to plan on spending? Well, you know, you can just get some um, friends and just do a regular Zoom reading if you have a play, and that literally costs you whatever it costs to get onto a, a pro account, which is like $14 with Zoom. Um, that's the lowest level. Um, then you go up from there. It's all depending on what your goal for the reading is. Is your goal to see if this iteration of your script works? Is it to record <laughs> it at a very high level of, of quality, you know, so that you can send it out to theaters and get in, uh, producers interested? Is it to put it behind a paywall? You have to ask what your, what your goal is. Um, so you can literally spend very little, almost nothing, to 25, 35, 15,000, even more if you'd like. Well, I think uh, Martin said that the, said the uh, limit was 50,000. Well, on, on this contract, yeah. On this con so we're only talking about one contract. There are other contracts that you actually don't have the information on. Is right. that There's a new media contract for budgets much higher. Yes. But I can't imagine anybody doing, from our world, that doing one and spending much more than that. Okay. Um, can we address, to the, to the degree that we know, uh, if there's any significant difference between uh, a, a, a completely live performance or a hybrid of something that's, that's live and also um, pre-recorded uh, pre and, and then edited? I mean, I, I, I can tell, I mean, I, I know the, First of all, you can't use Zoom. You have to find a different a different platform that will allow a combination of live and, and recorded material. And, and you can't do and if and if it's a musical, you can't do it live. But the, unless it's a solo, you can get away if with it's, solo. If it's one person and the music source is in the same room they're in. Yes. But you can do a hybrid. You can definitely. That's what we originally streamed for um, Madame Curie, it's a hybrid. <coughs> but so you did, you did stream it on Zoom then. So how does Zoom yes. work? How does that work with a, a combination of li live and pre-recorded material? Well, you have to have something else to act as a, a buffer. So you have all your cues lined up. David uh, Krakowski can speak uh, more on that. But we used QLab, which works really, really well. And right now, Joel Krantz is exploring OBS. 
So you do have to have something else, some kind of software to line up all of your cues. But yeah, we do stream on, on Zoom. It's really convenient, but the syncing issues are gonna be there. It's uh, primitive technology. I want to start using StreamYard because I feel, um, I've heard that that's much better and much more reliable. Well, it's created, have, it's created for, the, for the combination of live and, and recorded. Correct. Right. correct. And I, I think the, the, the most interesting useless fact I found out uh, when I was working on a musical for a while, which luckily I'm not working on it anymore, uh, but is the, 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 the big word is latency. That even in our conversation, there is a, a pause between what we're saying and what the other person is hearing. It's kind of like when you watch TV news and they've got somebody in a remote and they ask a question and you wait, wait, wait. It's the latency in the signal. And I discovered that there's a mathematical formula for how long that is. And it's based on the physical distance between the server that you're connected to and the server the other person is connected to. So if we had somebody participating right now from Europe, their latency would be longer. And when we're talking, we don't notice it. But if we all tried to sing a song together, it would be a disaster. Mm. It can't be done. Yeah, we tried that the other day. Somebody well, <laughs> on one of these Zooms, they said, let's, let's sing. It's like, no. But it the, there is very high level complicated software available that eliminates latency because musicians use it to rehearse remotely with each other. But it's, it's way beyond anyone's ability. But there are people now all over working on easier to use technology that maybe in six months we'll have that makes the, it, you know, it, it discovers where your server is, does the math, and delays or delays signals or speeds them up to get everybody into the same time frame. So something to look forward to. Uh, something to look forward to if we're still in COVID quarantine in the next three years. You no, know, but Kay and I have talked about this, and I've talked with other colleagues in the business. What we've learned from this, and I'm about to do a reading that we're going to probably spend about $10,000 on uh, with bells and whistles uh, and, and titles and subtitles and, you know, arranging where people are in their squares and underscoring and all this stuff to go out to regional theaters for possible productions. And we're all saying that in the future, when COVID is over, when we can all go back to having readings at Ripley Greer, we're likely to all do a streaming be reading through SAG-AFTRA first before we say a word to equity. And once we have that, then do a 29-hour reading live if we want to. Because then we have a reading that for all the people that can't come, they can still see it at a reasonable price to us. That's assuming that they don't change the rules once we're out of quarantine. They, they can't change the rules because SAG equity has no jurisdiction over anything which is not performed live in front of a paying audience. Um, there are a couple of questions I see in the, in the chat. Uh, does anything change, Claudia Zahn wants to know, does anything change whether you ask for donations or actually charge for tickets? I think the answer is no, but. Yeah, I think with Theater Authority, if, if you're soliciting donations for the, it's a, as a benefit that I think that qualifies. Yes. But if you go, if you go to equity, and, and go to the Theater Authority page, it kind of explains everything. Well, they're, they're not, they don't get involved in the question of whether it's a donation. The, everything is considered a donation. If, you have, if you're charging a ticket price, um, as a not-for-profit, you can still say that that's, that's a donation in this, in this particular instance because you're doing it as a benefit. Um, I'm not sure, you, it's not like serving them a meal if you do a benefit and, and, and people eat a meal, then that, that can't be considered but, tax deductible. But you have to say that it's, uh, it's a benefit and the minimum donation is, and always call it a donation. You yeah. can't call it a ticket price. Right. So it's, it's really semantics, Claudia. It's basically, uh, if you're doing it as a benefit, you're not really, you're better off not identifying it as a ticket price. Although the, the platforms that host these things do give you the option of actually ticketing it or, or, or asking for donations. That's, that's what we did when we, when we had our uh, reading series. But I think, again, it might just be semantic. It just, do you know any different, Kate? I thought there's a, 
suggested ticket price, which normally people just pay anyway. But it really would be more um, of a donation. You, you have to call it suggestion donation. The minute you say ticket, equity right. makes you pay. Yes. Okay, so let's go with suggested donation, which is what we did. And actually, the pay, it was a pay what you can suggest a donation. And our average, the audience average ticket price that was spent was $25. And we had some people who actually paid $100 because they wanted to support well, us. That's great. Yeah. So, the, so the, point, the point really of the theater authority is they, they want you to really make it a benefit. This is really to support a not for profit. You can interpret it any way you want to, but the, 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 the essence of it is that you're doing this presentation in order to raise money for a not-for-profit and that money that is coming in is going in to support the not-for-profit. Uh, I guess it's easier to understand if you call them donations instead of tickets, but I don't know if there's a final word on that. I think that's really semantic. Um, I think it is, but to be safe, I would say donation, yeah. <laughs> suggested yeah. donation. Why, why add to a headache? But it's a different button. <laughs> so you have to make sure you set, set it up right because you actually can create a ticket button and you can, or you can create a donate button on whether you're do, doing it on Zoom, on play, uh, uh, what's it, on the stage, which, which was the host for us. Play, um, they had, the, those were the options. We, we, didn't, we didn't charge a ticket price. We, we made it all suggested donation. But I, I don't think you have to. I think there are ways of getting around it. Um, Joan Ross Sorkin wants to know what the new equity rules are for a 20 hour and 29 hour readings and if the rules change, if it is recorded or not and streamed only once. Joan, what, the first, first thing you need to know is that we're, 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 not, we're not dealing with equity rules virtually. Once we go back to live theater, um, there is no longer a 20 hour or 20, 29 hour reading. Basically equities before COVID equity stage reading guidelines were for a t maximum of 29 hours. They didn't tell you how many hours you had to, had to rehearse, but it was a maximum of 29. And it didn't change, as Martin, correct me if I'm wrong, it didn't change whether it was a play or, or a musical. There used to be separate rules for musicals and plays. It was uh, 25, 29 before. 25 well, no, actually, it was, it was actually 16 for plays. A long point. time ago. Yeah. So now, now there was, it, 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 we're just at a 29 hour, 29 hour maximum for readings. Do you, want to, do you want to address that as if we were back in live theater? Well, the, here, here is the, the situation with equity. So if you're back in live theater, and this is the last conversation I had with equity before I stopped talking to them about this, when they came up with what it would cost you to stream your show, your reading, that you never did live. But so if you use the 29, first of all, if you use the 29 hour reading agreement to rehearse, you can't then go to sag after because you've already told equity you're doing it. And it's not legal to record a 29 hour reading. It never has been. However, they came up with this rule that all in with benefits and everything else, if you paid each equity member $1,000, you could show it twice. That's what they came up with last time I talked to them. So I think the answer is in, in the world of after we come out of COVID, if one wants to have a recorded version of a reading, do that through SAG-AFTRA before you do the 20 hour reading. So you do a SAG-AFTRA recording, you can have it for six months, then do the live reading and then give people that couldn't show up or that you want to get to access to the recorded version. Does Which it, you could do in a rehearsal hall, mind you. You could do, when we come out of COVID, SAG after doesn't care where you are. Right. You can go into a studio or into Ripley Greer and record your stage reading under a SAG after agreement to go out, then get an equity 29 hour reading agreement after that's done. Yeah. And they'll, they're going to be really unhappy and there's nothing they can do. Isn't there a waiting period or not? Still, if you're going from SAG to equity, is there still that waiting? I don't think so. Okay. Um. I want to address something that Mary had asked, and this is 
it's not what my SAG rep told me. So I'm gonna go down. Mary asked, is Martin saying that if you're only shooting with actors, do you pay the actors? That doesn't seem fair to actors if they're rehearsing many more than the days they shoot. Or did I misunderstand? So the answer was, you can choose to pay actors for a rehearsal, but under the SAG new media contract, you are not obliged to. And you just um, basically said that. Martin, um, can you clarify exactly what you said? Because I'm, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to find the, uh, my copy of the SAG after agreement. Because what Tim had told me was that SAG does not care whether you're rehearsing or shooting. You still have to pay the actors $125 a day. Okay, it may be my misunderstanding, but yeah, that, that makes more sense. Yeah. Okay. Right. I wanted to clarify that because that was, that's an important piece of it when, we, when we're trying to build our budgets for all of this. Right. So the, pra the practical piece that everybody needs to realize is that uh, although it's, it's a perfectly reasonable agreement to, to go with SAG-AFTRA, um, it may incur a little bit more money than you're used to spending for readings. So that's where we are with it. So the other option would be to use non-equity uh, non-union actors uh, and do what you can afford. Um, but I'm not sure there's an affordable way of doing it with the SAG, SAG after, and, and, it, and it's perfectly reasonable. It's not, it's not out of, out of, it's not yeah, out of I the mean, ballpark. I mean, you kind of look at, I just did the math. So you're talking about 166 a day for SAG after, including taxes and benefits, union right. benefits. So you do five days, that's around $800 per actor. And you can you can show it for six months. If you did it under an equity agreement, you'd pay a thousand dollars an actor for the same thing right. for twenty nine hours, not forty hours, which is what the SAG buys you. Each day is eight hours of work, and you can show it for two days after paying everybody a thousand dollars. But the thing I have to say on behalf of a lot of people that are pounding their heads in frustration uh, in the room. Uh, when we were doing staged readings, we were able to do 29 hour reads and we were able to pay actors a hundred or $150. It, uh, it wasn't as, exp it really wasn't as expensive. This is, this is much more, much more expensive now. Um, now the only thing is, Martin, I have a question. Like there's nothing stopping us if we have some actor friends, whether they're union or not, and doing a pizza reading, which is just a, a cold reading, you know, we used to call it pizza because we would feed them, um, but it's doing you a favor, right? If it's just a cold reading, Martin, or you could throw them, Venmo them $25 for their time or something. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I guess. I, I mean, the thing is in, in shutdown, I think the, the re it's also, what is the reason for doing it, you know? In, 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 in my part of the industry, the reason to do it is you still want to get new work out there to find producing partners, theaters that might want to do your work. So spending, you know, $10,000 on a reading that normally you spend, well, in, in my world, five or $6,000 for is still worth it. I mean, the reading I'm doing with the cast for 12 is going to cost $35,000. Uh, but what, what I wanted to go back and, and finish with the thought that I was starting to say was that um, comparing the live stage readings that we used to do pre-COVID to what we're trying to do virtually, uh, you will be paying your actors uh, a lot more, a lot more than you're, than, than you're used to. On the other hand, you won't have the expenses of, of, of the venue costs and the rehearsal room costs. So it's a trade-off. Uh, it's still going to come out more expensive. I can't, my, my head can't do the math so that it comes out to about to what, what it would have cost w when we were doing it live. Um, and that's a shame. That, right. That's kind of, yeah, well, that's a real shame. Well, to be devil's ad advocate, Bob, it's a shame, but everybody in an industry has been out of work since March mm -hmm. and actors and directors, everybody needs money, a paycheck. So what would be the point of an actor saying, oh, gee, I'll do a reading for free for you? I mean, actors really don't, despite the myth, just want to do 45 readings 
because they got to keep the instrument moving. Right. Well, there are actually there are some who, who there are some, will, but there are people have to make a living. So, I mean, I mean, to me, we all have to suck it up and say we're going to do a reading and we're going to give this actor six hundred dollars, eight hundred dollars. Well, that's why in my community we read each other's work. You know, uh, Neil Rubinstein read last week. He did his debut, and we all just have some fun. And we still read the work, and it still gives the the writer enough information and feedback, so it's worthwhile. Yeah, I mean, right. if, if you want to do a reading of like 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 Kate is saying, if you want to do a reading to develop a <coughs> to develop a work where it's sorry, the playwright, the director, and eight or ten actor friends, like a table read to hear it. Yes. With no outsiders invited. Right. That's a freebie, like it's always been. Mm-hmm. Because you're not doing a performance for anybody, you're not streaming a show, you're just having a reading like eight actors around a table. That's always a freebie. So if that's what you want to do is just with your friends, you know, read a new play and see what it sounds like. That's not a problem. And if there's two or three extra people there, like your husband or <coughs> mother-in-law, no one cares. And yes to Eric, uh, it's, that's, that is an informal table reading, yes. It's not, yes. Compar it's not comparable to the stage reading that we would, would have done in uh, pre-COVID days where an audience of any number could go. Actually, there was never a, there was never a limit to the audience for a stage reading. Showcase, you could, you could only have 99 people. But stage reading, you could have any number. Yeah, but you also, don't you also get the director and the music director, <laughs> which is also a big piece of the cost, uh, and not just the paying of the actors. So if you're doing a, a stage reading, you're involving more people. A table reading doesn't really have those people engaged. No, we're, yet. We're, we're in agreement with you, Eric. And that's no, a we're, cost. We're, yeah. we're, we're saying, it, it depends uh, all, Martin, all Martin was saying was if you can't afford to do the virtual equivalent of a staged reading of using a SAG after contract or the more expensive equity route to go, then you want to just develop your piece and not necessarily have a, a full audience there, you can do a table, a, basically a virtual table read. Yeah. Uh, you know, Martin was saying it's a virtual table read. You know, and e Eric mentioned directors, and this is really interesting. Uh, uh, so, I, I, you know, it occurred to me that, so, you know, we use developmental contracts for directors where there's no specified fee. You pay them whatever you want to on a SDC form, and you pay $50 a day for pension and health every day that they work on the reading. So, you know, if you do a 20 hour reading, you're paying 250 in benefits and whatever fee you negotiate with the director, the union could care less. And there's no property rights. Well, in talking to the Off-Broadway League, they said, well, you can't use an STC contract because then that will make equity think it's theater. And then you're in trouble again. And then I, I talked to the DGA, and you have to go to the DGA, the Director's Guild. And that's who's going to cover directors for your streaming reading. And I went, that sounds like a nightmare. Well, it turns out, I'm talking to DGJ and STC, the DGA wants nothing to do with this. They have so many issues trying to start up TV and film production. You know, that's really the only thing they're worried about right now. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want to know about it. And they told STC, just create a contract for remote streaming work. And, and, and we're going to say that's fine. You have jurisdiction. So SDC has jurisdiction for these. And they have a new, a new developmental contract. It's online for uh, 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 developmental remote content. It's identical to the other developmental agreement, except it says remote content on it. Isn't this different from what you told me yesterday? Did this just change? Yep. This is it's, new. Uh, guys, it, it basically it's happening every day. It's, it's day, day to day. Because I, I, I'm sitting here going, that's not what you told me yesterday. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, it's a changing world. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, it's going to be changing for the better. Um, and and for, I, I don't know if anybody here, but I know some people here have produced, you know, big shows, small shows. Uh, we think by Monday, the Off-Broadway League and Equity will come up with an agreement, finally, for the costs, if somebody wants to stream pre-existing content, like a high-quality archival video of a show, a multi-camera shoot you might have done of your Broadway or Off-Broadway show, Equity 
is developing with the Off Broadway League an agreement that allows pre existing content to be streamed, both paywall and non paywall. That's the archival material, right? Yeah, just anything you have that, yeah. Uh, we have another question. Um, Larry wants to know, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's Larry Daggett, I'm, I'm willing to bet. Um, does SAG New Media Contract Reading have a limit for how many hours of rehearsal? Uh, is there a, in other words, is there a maximum amount of rehearsal? No. I would think it's, not, it's, not Larry. It's eight hours you, a day, you could rehearse 25 days if you want to. Yeah, it's, 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 you're, it's, you're paying every day, so they're, why would, why would they limit the amount of money that an actor could make? And, and yes, he says he's under, it would be 166 per day. That's, that's true. So it's what we can afford. Um, this is not thrilling news for a lot of people in the room. Um, guys, uh, oh, I wanted to ask Martin something else, because Martin, you are involved in a large cast virtual uh, production that you're, that you're, you were telling me some interesting things about that. What can you, sh can you share anything about that? Because I thought it was very interesting when we were talking yesterday. See, which part of that? A lot of it. How you were, how you were able to uh, well, sort of d d have control over the frames, uh, who, well, the entrances, well, the exits. Can, can, can you remember the name of the software that this company is using? VIMX. VIMX, thank you. VMix. Yeah. So, you know, we, we talked to Kate about this and we were, you know, it's, it's 12 actors, we need editing, you know, post doing it. We want the squares in certain places on the screen every time an actor enters or exits. We want images at the beginning, we want images between scenes, it's incidental music, all has to be edited in after. And the quotes we're getting are sixteen dollars to $25,000 to do that, which is not unreasonable for the work that that entails. And we had no intention of paying that. So the one vendor I was talking about that quoted us $25,000, I said, well, we can't pay that. I, I think I said we had budgeted $6,000. Uh, and so we had a phone meeting and they said, well, if we use this other platform, vMix, uh, we can do everything you want for $7,500. Because what vMix does is kind of interesting. It's not the, the most ideal platform, but, and, and you can only have eight people on the screen at any one time. So only eight people can be involved. And this play has 12 people in it. But luckily never more than eight in one scene. Uh, is sort of eight people and you have to do a shooting script. Like right now on my screen, Bob is upper left, I'm upper right, and Kate is on the bottom in the middle. I don't know about anybody else, but that's where they are on my screen. It's Bob, me, and then Kate. And so you could decide that. And you have a shooting script and a stage manager who tells the, the co-producer in their editing room, okay, here comes the next scene. In the next scene, Q14, these three squares come in, these two squares go, and here's where they end up. Well, that was what I wanted to say. You actually have to do a shooting script. You have to do a shooting script. And, and you can also do fade outs, fade ins, wipes, and all that stuff. But in vMix, you can bring the cost down because everything else you can edit post. You know, you can add time, you can add music, you can do whatever you want to. Effects, but you can't move the squares around. But the other advantage in a lot of platforms, if people have looked at musicals, you end up with actors with a laptop and an iPhone at the same time to try to make this happen. Using vMix, like right now with the three of us on screen, if we were three actors in this play, we would see exactly this. So you're, you're talking, you can talk, I can talk right at you, Bob, I can talk at Kate, I could turn and talk to you, Bob, if you're really there on anybody else's screen, and make all those illusions uh, because it's happening in real time exactly as you see it. Uh, and this play has 19 scenes, so no scene is more than six minutes. So it's no big deal if you have to shoot each scene three or four times. Uh, but the advantage is the technology allows a much simpler editing process post. How does that deal with the latency issues? And in, 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 if there's no music, there's, you, you can't tell the latency when people are talking. Unless we have an actor in Australia, then it would be a problem. So music is still pre-recorded. 
Well, the, the, the music, the only music that we have in this thing is underscoring, which we'll, we will lay in in editing afterwards. Right. The actors won't hear it. And the other thing that we're going to do, the, the other two things, if you're doing these things, that's really important. Uh, you really don't want anybody with a wireless connection. Everybody needs to be hardwired into Ethernet. You could buy a long Ethernet cable or some other way, because wireless signals are unreliable and low quality. And like for this video, we're buying chairback blue screens for like 70 bucks each. So there's a blue screen behind, so every actor can have the same background. Yeah, not their apartment. And we're also gonna buy, not very expensive, but cameras with microphones for everyone. So everyone's being shot by the same piece of equipment to get a standardized look. And that's gonna add about $2,000 to our costs. But again, we're creating a video to actually sell a show to try to make money for the authors and the director. So we need to produce at a slightly different level. Well, Jeremy Handelman has something disturbing to say. He's saying that he, uh, to his understanding, vMix is only for PCs, not Macs. Is that possible? It may be. It'd be oh. wise of them. Oh, God. <laughs> so, as if there aren't enough challenges. Um, enough. Wow. Yeah, yeah, Bob, just to jump in, it, that doesn't mean the people who are performing need to be on PCs. It just means whoever's running the back end. Right. Oh, right. oh good. Oh, good. God. <laughs> how, how are we going to work that? You have to buy everybody a, everybody a PC who has a he, Mac. He just wanted to scare you. <laughs> Thanks for, for the me. scare, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, you know, Halloween came early this year. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, it came in, came in March. Um, so if you're an actor, you should have a, a green screen. You should have the ring light. Um, I just invested in one of the great big green screens because in Joel's, and that's right, in Joel's um, ocean in a teacup, we want people moving. So I got the big kind that goes down on the ground and everything. So we're all exploring this new territory and hopefully you're having fun. And, and the one thing for people that may not have done a musical this way before, besides the fact that you can't do it live, I mean, it does require that, let's say you have a number with five people and there's harmony and everything else. They all have to sing by themselves with just the track in their ear. No two people can ever sing together at the same time. Anybody who's ever recorded a, a CD and knows how to yeah. record in studio, well, it's, it's, this is not, unf not unfamiliar. Right. Um, I, 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 maybe David Krakowski, do you, wanna, can, do you wanna come in and explain how QLab works and how you've worked with QLab? Yes, you just did a webinar. Yeah, Kate did a great webinar on that. I watched it. I, sorry, oh, can, David. You, can you give us a, a short version of it? Sure, I did um, <clears throat> Madame Curie with all pre-recorded, it was a hybrid. So I used uh, pre-recorded videos, music videos, that were made uh, the way you just explained. And then I had the actors do the dialogue uh, live. And when the time for a song came up, I ran the show. And it's quite nerve wracking to do it, but um, QLab allows you to have all the cues set. You just trigger the word go at the proper time and uh, it worked. So you have to actually go through a number of screens, a number of other steps with to to, to do that on Zoom. But, oh, can uh, you do it? Can you even do it on Zoom? Because that's how we did, Madam Curie. Sure. And it was hybrid, so he had um, recorded music, and then the actors were live, and then he switched over to the pre-recorded song. Right. But, 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 okay. So, but, so but am I correct, David? Though that I mean, I I saw the the first version of Madam Curie that. Kate shared with me that the songs were audio only. No, they were audio and video. They, um, I, I did it the way Ted Arthur described right. Bob on your show um, way back when in May. Is that like our second or third one? Yeah. Yeah. Martin, um, there, there were numbers. The ensemble numbers were voice only. Right. With, um, Correct. Right. Uh, and I did uh, what I call a lyric video where uh, the lyrics appear right for the chorus. And actually, um, the audience liked that. I got a lot of comments that people like to be able to just read the chorus words. They didn't really want to watch the chorus. So people probably go to a lot of foreign movies. 
<laughs> since, since I'm not getting this, there might be at least another person in the room is not getting this. How do you do it on Zoom? Is it a share? Do you share the screen? Do you basically p bring up uh, a video that's on your that's that you've actually brought up on your on your computer already, and you just share yes. that screen and play the video? Yes, you and okay. it takes two monitors to make it work. You run on your home monitor and then use a second monitor where you're going to display the image that goes to the audience. So for all of us who have two monitors, okay. <laughs> Well, it's an additional hundred dollars. You know, it was not a big expense. Oh, the monitor. That's right. It's just not the whole computer. Yeah. It's just a, just a monitor. And, and QLab is very user friendly. Um, it, they rent it to people like me and you for seven dollars and fifty cents a day. So I rented it for about five days, I think, or so. It cost me fifty dollars to do that reading. So QLab. These are all sorts of things that, that people need to know. And, and, and we, also, we, we assume so much when we talk about this. So and, QLab is not is not an app that you actually own. You you rent it by the day. Right. Well, you download the app mm -hmm. and you have it on your, installed, but you can't um, do the two screen setup, which is really what you want to do. You don't want people to see a cursor. And, you know, sometimes with sharing screens, you see people's cursor and their email, and you don't want that at all. You only want the visual. And um, so it was worth doing that. Someone wants to know if you can use a laptop and a tablet. And I said yes. No, oh, you did say yes. Okay. So, David, David, could you quickly, because I think it's really fascinating. So when you're recording, let's say, four people singing a number together, using QLab, how do you do that and eliminate latency or not have a latency? Well, um, I, I didn't record using QLab. I, I sent out um, using the Ted Arthur method for Hassan Time's birthday party. I sent out music tracks to everyone in the cast and they recorded back. You know, they, would, they listened on one device and recorded on another One device. voice at a time. And I got back what I call acapella videos. Right. And then I synchronized those, and it wasn't that hard, right. with the orchestra track. So it, it looks virtually like they were singing. Right. And, then, and then I did that in iMovie, and I recorded that, <clears throat> that whole thing, and, and saved it as an iMovie. So when I was triggering, what I was triggering with QLab was an iMovie. It was, a, it was an MP4 file. And, and uh, one thing I found is that Zoom will work pretty well if you do a, late, um, a resolution of 540p. That's half of 1080. If you try and go to 720 or 1080, it's the disaster. It, 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 the signals arrive at different speeds. But 540 worked pretty well. Why would a, a lower resolution be more accurate than a higher? <clears throat> Um, well, I think the sound travels the fastest, and then the signal catches up. And if it's a very complex signal, like a 1080 signal, high definition signal, it takes a long time to get through the tube. That's my layman's <laughs> explanation of what's Okay. And if anybody knows differently, let, let us know eventually. Um, but you know, I have to say that every stage manager already knew QLab. All the stage managers had it on their computer, and that was before COVID. So, you know, now anybody can rent it themselves and just do what Dave did. The other option is OBS, which is free. And uh, right now, Joel Kranz is learning that. Do you want to say anything about that, Joel? Okay, I'm, I'm just learning it for uh, Dave and recording purposes at this point to record uh, the performances of the actors and the vocals of the actors. I, I have not yet figured out how to use it for, I, I, my plan is not to use it for editing and for combining all these scenes together in, in, a, in a movie. Well, can we, can we invite people into the room now and maybe, maybe ask questions? You can put on your video and your audio and come in and so we can see you and you can talk to us. Um, any questions? Yes, please, uh, please uh, stop my video. Bob, you have it off. <laughs> All right, <laughs> me on. let me find you, let, let, let me find you. I did, a, um, I did a Zoom video recently 
And I did it in six hours with four actors. And it was a technical mess. And I got a great IT person. And he cleaned it up. <clears throat> and then um, in order to control where it went, I posted it on Vimeo because it has a lot of control features. Come on. Could you hear that? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, that's, I wanted to let you know that the, the most important part of it, it looks really good. I got a lot of uh, fantastic response to it, but the, the tech, it's almost essential to have a good IT person. Well, that's something we've talked about. Uh, yeah. A lot of us can learn the tech, but I, the, you, there are people that, that specialize in it and, and yeah. do it. And I've said this before, and I've had people argue with me, but essentially the, the job that was delegated to a stage manager in live presentation is essentially now a tech person who should have the organizational skills of, of a stage manager. Um, so it's a, it's, a new, it's a new role. That, that needs to be played. We all need somebody good to do that for us. Absolutely. Um, and there are lots of stage managers who are not working now, so they're probably the best place to go to for such people. Well, they need to learn the tech. Stage managers who yeah. don't know the tech are not going to be useful. Oh, that's why they are all learning the tech. Okay. Who, who is that speaking? Eric. Eric. Oh, Eric. Okay. Hi, it's Candy. I have a question for everybody who's done these virtual. Uh, I did one for a one woman show that I do and I had to get all kinds of guarantees that they wouldn't then copy it, save it, use it again, and then never hire me as a live performer. Um, and they seem like what you're doing here on the Zoom, anything that's Zoom oriented, uh, whoever is the host, they can record it. And I'm just having them sign that they're not going to record it and share it but then they end up recording it and it's in their archives. And if anyone has some experience with this, there's only so much I can do. But uh, for those of us who are live performers, we want to have a job when all of this is over. And for every one of these things that has been recorded, they can just play it again for another bunch of patrons or visitors or whatever. And I wouldn't know about it unless I kept track of every individual that was signed on for every one of these things. So and Candy, that's exactly why equity forbids taping anything because they, they don't, they don't trust that people will be discreet about the use of the, of the videotapes, but, yeah. but it, this is allowed. Uh, without, what were, uh, Martin's, Martin's muted. Uh, one yeah. reason I put it on Vimeo is that you can, there's a lot of privacy controls. It, you don't have well, to. I mean, if, if, when you disseminate it, you need to put it on a platform like Vimeo or a YouTube private channel that you pay a small amount of money for. <laughs> and then everybody that watches it, you get a password to. Yes. And here's the interesting thing that you're talking <laughs> about that. Uh, a dedicated YouTube channel for only people who signed up or who had uh, paid a ticket price or whatever to this uh, venue, they gave the people the uh, password to get in and see it. And then all of a sudden I get an email from my sister in California who has this software, simple software that's free that anybody can get, that as long as she can get the address of the URL of the YouTube, she can download it and she downloaded it and I didn't even know. Well, then maybe you don't use YouTube. Maybe you use Vimeo or platforms like that. And you also, I mean, what we're doing is, is only, and again, it's a little bit more money, but single-use passwords. Send somebody a password. Only they get that password. If you have 10,000 people, they get 10,000 different passwords. Oh, so an and individual they, password. Yeah, and single-use ah, sin, ah. single passwords. Yeah. Well, these were single-use, but right. it was single-use for two days. Right. So, so yeah. control the emails they go to. So I guess I want to actually ask everybody, um, what have we learned from the Democratic con Convention about using virtual performance? <laughs> Wasn't it pretty amazing? Done. Yeah. I mean, we, we, there are takeaways for all of us from watching, and I did, I did watch all four nights. I will confess, I watched all four nights. Um, it was easier than thinking about what was going on in the country. Um, so... Um, 
Yes. Can I interject? I would, was wondering where would you access single-use passwords? Which website provides that? And also for the theater uh, producers who are looking to train stage managers to work their shows, we use a consultant that I met at TCG this year. Her name is Leanna Keys. I provided her email address there. She trained our stage managers to run our reset series uh, virtually. We used OBS Stream and we used Restream IO as well as Zoom in order to have um, production that was more easily manipulated so that we can get the images that we wanted on the screen. So be sure to take her information. The answer about the passwords is if you do what I did, just Google single use streaming passwords and all kinds of platforms will come up that offer it different levels of service, different pricing and so forth. But this is the most secure way to, uh, to protect it. But again, we've just learned that don't use YouTube because it can be hacked. What did you use, Martin? Uh, we don't know which one we're using yet. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't done this yet. Vimeo is very good. Yeah. Vimeo, yeah. I know we used Vimeo in our West End show uh, that we did uh, with a full length video of the show that never existed. Uh, I, bought, I, I have to run to this other. Right, right. It's 601. Uh, you're, you're one minute late. Go. Go, Martin. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. Um, RK uh, has his hand raised. So, RK, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say, well, you know, for a development tool, uh, this is really good. I've used it in my own productions as, as a development tool, but the real, you know, as a commercial producer, the real goal is to get it out in public and getting it paid for to be seen. And that seems to be, right now, there is no market for any of this product. And if there is a little bit, it certainly can't pay for the production, even upon multiple viewings of this. So uh, we have to think of very creatively of how we position things and get them into the marketplace where an audience will be willing and happy to pay for that experience. The RK is constantly asking the same question, which a lot of us are asking, how do you monetize this? This is all very well, but we're figuring out how to do it. Now let's figure out how to make money or break even at least on it. Uh, there, there's expenses involved and it would be nice if we could find a way of covering those expenses. Hi, Carolyn Brown, nice to see you. Um, so uh, we can do, we can continue our conversation uh, by visual hand raises. We can either continue our conversations uh, right now uh, all together, or we could actually do breakout rooms so you'd have a chance to actually meet each other on a little bit more in an intimate scale. Like I'd have like four or five of you in a room. Um, anybody interested in break, my, my putting you into breakout rooms and meeting each other? It would be random. Uh, Okay, and how many people would prefer to just continue talking, it, all of us in this one big room? I don't know what to do. <laughs> Kate, I'm leaving it up to you. What should we do? Breakout rooms. Breakout rooms? So uh, everybody should really turn their videos on, uh, on if, you, if, you're, if your video is off so that people can actually meet you. Um, and I just want to reiterate what I was saying earlier. What my plan for next Friday is to do, uh, have a couple of people representing uh, the regional theaters and talk about how COVID, COVID is impacting the regional theaters and what, what the responses have been around the country. Um, hopefully I can make that happen. I, I have some people who, I have one person on board and several people that are maybes. Um, and I'm going to continue doing these, by the way, uh, <laughs> until you make until you tell me to stop um, so plan on being with us every Friday at 430 now through September possibly October and possibly November I'm just gonna try my best to make it keep happening one thing that'll make it easier for me to do this would be if you actually would email me with suggestions for things that you'd like to talk about uh, so t send me the topics and I'll try to find the people to talk about it or send and me the donations. people that can talk what and donations ah the donations. other thing 
R.K. Green, by the way, of all people to, to, to remind me, R.K. Green is the person who single-handedly rescued the True Voices Play Reading Series this year. If without his support, we would not have been able to do the readings of two plays that we did. So thank you again, R.K. I always will be grateful to you for that. Yeah. Um, and I'm grateful to you for reminding me to say that although we do this for free and we're in a, a very strange period of, of our lives and in, in the world, um, and I know that money is an issue for so many people. Uh, I, I, I don't think I'm going to stop doing pay what you can, but I do want to ask people that can afford to give something to, to donate to us because it keeps us running. It keeps us going. It makes it possible for me to do this every week. Um, the donations can be given at true online, T R U online.org hyphen, not hyphen slash. I keep doing this true online.org slash make all lowercase make hyphen a hyphen donation and if you want to be a part of the true community and support us as a member you can go to trueonline.org slash membership and join us so um i'm gonna i'm gonna do breakout rooms